Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I like to say welcome to the new ones. Welcome to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous works, and it works good. And the only reason this morning that I know it works good is, number one, I'm standing up here clean and sober, and I got some dear friends sitting out here clean and sober, so I know this thing works. And I'm also not so stupid this morning to think every last one of you sitting in this room this morning is going to benefit by me standing up here no way, not even close. But I also know that my God didn't send me in vain. He sent me in order that maybe that I talk to that one individual in this room this morning that maybe needs to hear something that I have to say. Now, the rest of you, <clears throat> got to take care of this, right? We'll probably learn a whole hell of a lot of patience, <laughs> tolerance, and some understanding as I get through with this. But before I start, I want to I wanna thank my friend Breton, and I want to thank all the wonderful people of this community because... What a lovely community you have. And I felt the warmth and the love in our lovely friend's home tonight. And I know I'm going to take you in my heart and in my soul that I won't forget this lovely time I've had up here. But the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says this to me, that I must tell you a little bit of what it was like, what happened, and how I live today. And oh, thank God. It says in a general way. (laughs) So believe me, the story I'm telling you this morning is as nice as I can get it for you. (laughs) I call it cleaning it up a bit. And as you can see earlier, the lovely lady that I sponsored was standing up here learning to clean it up, right? Because you see, very early in my life, I was a rebel from the word get. I was one of these tight kids. If my mother told me to go south, I immediately turned around and went north without even thinking about it. And I guess I had a pretty typical mom that used to sit home and she preached pretty typical things to her daughters and this one did. She used to sit home and say things like, be a nice girl. Go to school and study. When you get of age, you marry a nice guy, and you move off to the suburbs, and you bake cookies. (laughs) Yeah! Now, that didn't sound interesting to me at all at the age of 11 years old. Now, I was born and raised in East Los Angeles. And I'm here to tell you this morning that East Los Angeles didn't have a darn thing to do with my drinking. It's the way that I drank that got me to Alcoholics Anonymous. But to show you how slick I ran most of my life, I didn't know East Los Angeles was a ghetto until I was in my 30s. So that shows you how slick I was out there. But at this early age, I used to go home and I used to watch gangster movies on TV. And I got obsessed with watching gangster movies on TV. So I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wanted to grow up and become a gangster because it sounded more interesting than baking cookies in the suburbs, right? Now, they didn't have no good old gangsters like they had on that TV, but I picked me the closest thing that I can find to it at this time. I joined my first gang at the age of 11 years old. 
And the initiation to that gang that day was I had to drink a fifth of white port and lemon juice. Now, if anything burnt nasty to my 11-year-old body was white port and lemon juice. It burnt going down, and it burnt coming up again, but I chug a lug till it stayed down. Now, I don't know what happened to anybody else that day that was being initiated, but I do know what happened to me. Between the top and the bottom of that bottle, I fell in love. And I didn't fall in love with, gee, what a cute bottle this is in. Or I like the color of this stuff. I fell in love with what it did in my gut. It filled that big hole that I had right smack in the middle of my gut. And it filled up all my fears and it filled up all my insecurities. And I stood up straighter and I looked at the gal next to me and I said, where are we going? And who are we going with? Because I was ready to live. Now, I wasn't a daily drinker at this time, and I hadn't even discovered none of those morning drinks. I was one of these Friday, Saturday, and Sunday drinker, and whenever I can get my hands on it. Now, I've had a few people ask me dumb questions. Even in Alcoholics Anonymous, they've asked me a few dumb questions, and this usually falls around the Kansas area. Hmm. Someone will slip up to me and say something like, How did you acquire alcohol at the age of 11 years old? Hmm. And I said, Very simple. I stood on corners by liquor stores. And I hit on people, going in and out of there. And eventually, somebody's going to come by and buy you a bottle. But do you know, I had bad days, even then. Hmm? Somebody would come by and rip me off for my booze or my money. And with all my heart, to this very morning, I believe it was alcoholics who that did that to me. <laughs> huh? Had to be, had to be. So if any of you in this meeting have ever been in the East Los Angeles area some many years back and ripped off an 11-year-old kid, you can make amends to me after this meeting's over because those were bad days, right? <laughs> bad. But I continued, and I, I had an oddball sister born into this family. Odd. Couldn't understand her for the life of me. She was the kid that sat home and learned to bake those damn cookies. And if my mother told her to go south, she went south. She didn't go north, she went south. She got A's on her report card. She went to school and she studied. She was a nice kid. And she was a very gentle lady. She was a lady. She had a very soft voice. She went to school. And she went to Mass twice on Sundays. And I tried to teach her all these good things I had learned. Like how to rip, how to run, how to ditch. She wouldn't go for them. She even made her bed. And I thought, God, they gave us the wrong baby in the hospital. She had to be wrong. She didn't fit into this. But I never forgot my partying with her when we came to the parting of the waves when she came home with her husband-to-be, and they were already engaged to be married. <laughs> and I come strolling into this house with my hip, slick, cool self, and I come strolling across this living room, and this guy was sitting on the couch with a cool cut on his head, a pair of Ivy League pants, and white shoes. This guy was square, square. I believe he was from around this area somewhere, right? <laughs> no, he <laughs> He was not a city slicker guy. And I 
remember grabbing this sister and I hauled her into the bedroom and I gave her my famous lecture. Are you crazy? You're going to marry this guy, move out to the suburbs and be miserable for the rest of your life. Now, she got a strange look on her face that she got every time I talked to her. And Hal, I didn't understand that one for years either. Well, thank God she didn't listen to me. Because to this very morning, right now, she's still out in them suburbs baking cookies with that guy. And this wonderful man just passed away. With, with them with 41 years of continuous marriage? Whoa, that just blew me away. So I chose to go the other way. Thank you. And I went on a hell of a run. Around the age of 18 years old, my friends started marrying off, and hell, I didn't want to be left out. So I looked around this neighborhood and I found me the hippest, slickest, coolest guy. I can get to marry me at the time. And me and him were going to go low riding off into the sunset, right, forever. Right? Hermanos por vida. Now, unfortunately, three months of marriage and this man started screaming. And he started screaming about things that I didn't understand. He started talking about, when are you going to wash and when are you going to cook, cook? Then his next words completely threw me. He says, you know, you don't drink like a lady. And I said, well, how do ladies drink? He says, ladies drink out of a glass, not out of a bottle like you do. Mm. <laughs> And you see, he didn't understand. Any time I uncapped the bottle, I always drank for relief. Now, I know this morning there's going to be a few of you in this room that will identify with a couple of drunks I'll talk about. You know those drunks we come to the next day? <laughs> And we ask dumb questions before we learn not to ask the dumb questions. And we might say something like this. Does anybody know where we left the car? <laughs> Does anybody know why I have this black eye? And this one was my favorite. Did we have fun last night? <laughs> Newcomers, if you ever identified with any of those, welcome to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. You're on. You see, I thought that was normal drinking. Abnormal drinking to me were people who sipped. They're still abnormal to me. It's just okay today, right? two-fisted drinkers. And I continued, and that marriage dissolved, and it dissolved very quickly after this. But I had one son, and I'm here to tell you this morning that I love my son. And I love my son like a mother loves a child. And I held this little one close to me, and I felt lo love for that small human being. And I made a statement in that hospital that I meant with all my heart. I said, everything in there is to give, I'm going to try to give it to you. And I met that new one. But you see, I didn't know. I did not know I was afflicted with the disease of alcoholism and also drug addiction. And that I would get progressively worse. I always thought that I would get better. My famous cries throughout my life till I crawled through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous went like this. Tomorrow. Hmm. Hmm. We remember those. I'm going to get myself together and everything's going to be okay tomorrow. And my next famous cry went like this. If they would only just leave me alone and let me drink. 
Everything would be okay. I don't want the information. You know those ones that give you information before you go out to drink? And they'll say stuff to you like, you know if you drink olive oil, it will coat the lining of your stomach and you can drink more. Well, I'm here to tell you, newcomer, that don't work either. Right? All you got is a mix. <laughs> and I tried all those tricks. And I continued to run. And I continued to run hard. And I ran with a lot of fast people. And I ran with a lot of fast living. And I know what it is to start to get anger and hate and resentments, even though I didn't know what the word resentment meant until I got to you. And it started to go deep inside of me. And I knew what it was to have fear run through every fiber of my body. And I ran hard at this time. And I met another man that passed through my life, and God was this guy cool. Hmm. Kind of looked like he was in the state of rigor mortis. He didn't move too fast, and I liked that, right? So I took the living with this guy, and I found out one thing real quick about him. He wasn't real cool in the morning. He was real nervous and twitchy, and his nose ran a lot. And when he came out of that bathroom, he was cool. Now, it didn't take Ruth too very long to figure out that whatever he had in that bathroom, I wanted some. I don't know what it is, but I want it. And I bugged that guy, and I bugged him long enough. He hauled me on that bathroom. I sat on that bathroom floor, and I took a fix of heroin with this guy. Now, again this morning, I wish I could tell you, no, nah, Ruthie's not going to like this run. I'm not going to like smashing through the lies I'm now going to smash through. I'm not going to like those feelings of desperation that are going to run deep inside of me. Because I know loud and clear today that desperate people do desperate things. Because I did a lot of desperate things. I had to hurt a lot of people. And a lot of people had to hurt me. And I had to cover those feelings with more alcohol, more drugs. And I continued to run. It was around this time, I started going in and out, in and out, and in and out of those jails. But I never, ever, dear God, ever want to forget the last half. And I'm going to tell you loud and clear this morning why I don't want to forget the last half. God bless the old timers that I sobered up with. Some of you around here might have seen the kind of old timers that I'm going to talk about right now. You know those old timers that piss you off? Those. You know those old timers that sit down there with that big book called Alcoholics Anonymous and say stuff like, if it isn't in the book, it's bull, that kind. Those ones that every once in a while kind of punch you between the eye eyes with something, those kind. Those kind that piss you off a lot and hurt your feelings sometimes, those guys. Those are the guys that I sobered up with. Yeah. They didn't let me move too far, right? And I'm going to tell you what, most of those old guys now, today, are gone. And they died with con continuous sobriety. No breaks between them. Continuous sobriety in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, because AA works, and AA works good. That's what they pounded. And this is what they had told me. Because you see, for me, I was very shame-based when I got to you. So I don't want to tell this story, and I want you to know loud and clear to this very morning, I still don't want to tell this story. I'd rather sit down where you're sitting and listen. But God has other reasons why I have to do this. I don't know why. 
But a couple of years ago, and I'm going to share you this loud and clear, a couple of years ago, because, you know, AA gets good. And if you went where I live today, and you saw me where I live today, you would not believe where I came from because of what Alcoholics Anonymous has done in my life. So I, I look good, right? I've cleaned up good. You guys clean me up real good. You've cleaned my mouth up. You clean my act up. You've taught me how to be courteous, and uh, and you and I do this. So what I did a couple of years ago, because this is an honest program, I decided that I don't want to tell this story no more. Because I'm a nice lady that lives in suburbia today. Mm. And them damn old timers came in my head. And this is what they said again. You forget where you come from. You better get ready because you're going to go back. And no, you do not have to live in it. Just never forget where we come from. And that's why newcomer, old-timer, in-betweeners, that I come, even reluctantly, but I come. Because I owe my life to Alcoholics Anonymous and a loving higher power and rooms like this and people like you that kept this door open so I can live. So the person I'm going to talk about for the cups, cup, next couple of minutes, the one I didn't want to talk about no more, I will not clean it up. I will tell you exactly what happened. Alcohol and drugs took its toll. And I did not trust one living human being walking on the face of this earth. And when you ran with people like I ran with, you don't trust. And they had sent me to a place called CRC, the California Rehabilitation Center in Narco, to rehabilitate me for the second time. While I was in that institution, I hurt somebody pretty badly, and I am not proud. And one of the things they did not tolerate in that institution at that time was violent people, and I was very violent. So they shipped me from that institution and they shipped me to a place called CIW Women's Penitentiary. And while I was in the Women's Penitentiary, I swore off of drugs completely. Never again in my whole life am I ever going to use drugs again. And I completely swore off. And after a period of time, they let me out of that institution. And after a period of time, I came back into L.A. And before I even reported to any parole officer or anything, I walked into the nearest bar. And I sat on that bar stool and I ordered me one drink. What's one drink going to do to me? You know that drink we need to take the edge off to unclench the jaws? That one. And I sit down and I ordered that one drink and that drink went down. And after the fourth or the fifth, I was instant wonderful. Alcohol did not leave my life until I came through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I used to stand up to people and I would say, you see this bottle? This bottle is the only friend I got in the whole wide world. You are not my friend. This is the only friend I have. And I kept it and I would lie, cheat, steal, anything to keep alcohol in my life. And you heard what I said earlier. For me, I had to burn every last human being out of my life. And I still say loud and clear to this very, very morning, if there was one more person I could have jived, connived, manipulated, I might not have made it to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. But fortunate for me, I burn them all out. And at the end of my drinking, my family made a big mistake, big one. I claim to this very, very morning, it's the biggest mistake my family ever made because my mom got too old to take care of my children. Children. Children I didn't even know. Huh. So I love Nieves. I was one of those, here, mom, take care of the kids, come back three to five years later. Gee, they're grown. 
Huh? Give him a few more bucks that I stole in and off I go again. Because I didn't want to be around him. I didn't want him to see me. But my mom got too old to take care of these children, so my mom sent five children home to a full-blown alcoholic. Full-blown. And again this morning, I don't have to describe to you what went on in my household because you know what went on in my household. I drank. I don't function without a drink or something in my body. And these children are there and I don't know them and they sit there. And if you would have went to my house at that time, you would have said something like, Boy, those are good kids. Those kids don't talk, they don't move, they don't laugh, they don't run around, they sit like this. And they're quiet, very quiet children. Because they know if this mother's drunk, she's going to rock them back and forth and make those famous promises about tomorrow and I'm going to get myself together. But if I'm in between coming up or coming down, the enraged monster is going to come out. And now those children are the recipients of that war. There's a beautiful man that I love very dearly in this program by the name of Bob Limke. And the reason that I love this man so very dearly, an old-timer in Alcoholics Anonymous, he describes what went on in my household at that time. And he said, if you want to see the effects of alcoholism on the children, go to any junior high school or high school at lunchtime and look in the far corners because in the middle of it you're going to see a noisy, noisy children. And they're going to be laughing and they're going to be talking and they're going to be throwing things and they're going to be talking about they went to Disneyland or they watched a movie the night before. But look in the far corners where the ones that are not talking, the quiet ones. The ones that were like mine, that are not talking about what went in their house the night before. Those were my children. Elementary school age. My daughter literally failed the second grade due to emotional problems because she couldn't talk. Couldn't talk. And it was around this time, and I believe it with my whole heart, I believe it up to this very night or morning right now, that God stepped into my life and he did for me what I couldn't do for my own self. And the first event that he did in my life is he came in with a very early morning with court orders with the county welfare department and they had court orders to pick up these children. And these social workers ran into this house, gathered up these children, and started to haul them off and put them in a county car. And this maniac mother ran out into the driveway as they started to haul these children away. My oldest boy was looking out the back window of the car. Now, I've seen many looks out there, and if you're an alcoholic, you know what kind of looks I'm talking about, because, boy, have we seen them many times. But when I saw that look in my boy's eyes, I wanted to die. Sometime later, they hauled me to another kind of courtroom, and I had been in plenty of courtrooms most of my life. But I had never, ever been in a child custody courtroom. And a judge went through my jacket. For you that don't know jacket, that means record. <laughs> went through my record. <laughs> and he went from 11 years old up to 32 years old, looked down on me and said this. A woman like you should have never borne no children. And we will see to it for the remainder of your life. You never see those children again. Boom, and they were gone, wards of the court. I left there and I knew what it was to feel rotten, no good, zero, zero, over and out. Death would have been wonderful. But we don't die easy. 
We die hard. We die hard. We die under bridges chewing our tongue. We die people spitting on us. That's how we die. And I went home then and I decided at that time to drink myself to death. It's over. I'm here again to tell you new one, alcoholism is a slow, painful disease. After it strips of everything, it'll go down the line. And I was at the tip end of that line. Surrender. And I'm here again this morning to tell you loud and clear when you're backed up against the wall, it's easy to surrender. Yeah. When God's boy, when you're stripped of everything and there's nothing left, you can surrender real easy. Boy, that eagle and that prey, boy, goes right out the window. Right? It's gone. And on that dirty bathroom floor, all alone, before I even heard of anything called Alcoholics Anonymous, I made my first surrender. On that dirty bathroom floor, I screamed, God! And I screamed it. I didn't tell you that for a long time. I screamed, God, help me! I was never an unbeliever in God. I knew there was a God. Even a little, little, little teeny child. Somebody told me something about God because I knew there was something. I knew what it was to be agnostic. I was a deadly afraid of it, but I knew there was something. And I had a crazy thought at that time, and I had carried it all my life. And it was that God didn't like people like us. God liked people like my sister. Because, see, she was a nice lady, and she lived in the suburbs, and she talked sweet, and she didn't say bad words. And she was nice. And I, my thought went, well, see, he don't like me because I'm st- from the streets. I'm nothing. And I found out sometime later that I was wrong about that. I found out in Alcoholics Anonymous that he loved me very much. And I also know for a fact today he don't love me anymore then he loves each and every one of you. And I know that for a fact. But on that dirty bathroom floor, I screamed the word, God help me. Now this God moved very strangely with me because I was strange, right? Mm -hmm. Some nights later, some people ventured over too drunk to drive. I drove their car. I ended up back in that county jail for women on the first and only at that time called 502. When I got physically healthy, I was laying on a bunk one night, and over the intercom, they announced, AA in the dining room. Hmm. Now, with all this wisdom I had learned from the streets, and at that particular time I was pretty streetwise, not today, I poked a bunkie of mine and said, what the hell is American Airlines doing in this place, right? <laughs> And with all her wisdom, she said, I don't know. Hmm. I said, well, they must be hitting rock bottom for stewardesses, right? (laughs) And we need a job when we get out of this place. So, of course, you know, it turned out to be Alcoholics Anonymous. And for its nice ladies. Dressed up like this. Or in the front with a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I don't know what they were talking about. They were talking a strange language. And I was like, mm, forget it. And I poked her, forget it. They're not going to let us in that organization, you crazy. So I left there, and I left there with good intentions because, you see, I'm going to do it on my own. I don't need nobody. I still got that false pride. You know, that false front. And I'm going to tell you about that false front up front here. That very false front up here. Tough. I showed you tough exterior. I scared you. And I keep that front up. But behind the front, was an 11 year old scared kid crying, full of fear. And I didn't want nobody to see that 11 year old scared kid. So I put the front up. 
the top front. So you can see that. So I left there with good intentions, huh? I'm not going to get drunk like that. Three months later was a disaster, leaving with the mattress on the floor, Viva La Raza across the ceiling. Still can't figure that one out. And the landlord had offered me $100 to move out as soon as possible. Right. <laughs> Things were looking up. I had some money coming. Ah. Yeah. Huh? When God bless that gal, I jailed with God love her. Somewhere during that meeting, she caught you can make a phone call to Alcoholics and I, so she phoned. And that night, God love them. Two people came down there on what you call a 12 step call. And they started toting us off to these funny meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, full of fear. Sitting far back as I can get in the group, right? Putting on the toughest face I can show. <laughs> And God bless my old home group. They tolerated me. From a distance, they used to say, keep coming back. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and they didn't tell me to get out. And they didn't tell me stuff like, oh, you know, you have a bad attitude. It's the only one I had. <laughs> but I had one now. Yeah. yeah. And they would smile, keep coming back. I thought, these people are nuts. And I would sit far back and my finger would come out. Right? Because if I can judge you, I don't have to look at me, right? So I keep my finger out at you. And I go, uh huh. Look at that one. He's so old, he ought to stop drinking. Yeah. And you still tolerated me. Then one day, and I gotta share, I don't know why I wanna share this, I guess cause I shared it with Britt, my friend. One day I was one year sober. One year and I'm starting to grow a little bit. Right? I actually walked to the podium to blow out the candle on the cake. Yeah. But you know what they did to me then in my group? They took my cake and they took it to the back to the kitchen and they cut it and I went back there and I said what are you doing they said we're cutting the cake and I said why they said we share it I said bullshit it's mine <laughs> I don't share <laughs> they said we give it to the other members I said no I don't want them to eat my cake I want my cake right I need it too so I didn't take my two year because I didn't want you to eat it <laughs> and then God bless you gently you sat next to me and said Ruby do you know why we take cakes I said this year the reason we take cakes is for the benefit of the new one. To show them that AA works, and AA works good. I said, oh. And I started to grow. Then one day, God decided, not me, not me, that I needed one of those funny things called a sponsor. Mm. Didn't want one, I saw what they did. <laughs> Like things like where's the book going to mean? But the sponsor, and at that particular time and in that particular group, they kind of handpicked them. So this sponsor walked right up to me, and you know how they look in your eyes, stuff, and said, "I'm your sponsor." Mm. Now God at that time knew what kind of sponsor to send to me. One of them no nonsense type sponsors. Another one like I shared about earlier. That make you mad. Right? Oh, a lot made me mad. Huh? And the sponsors started pounding real strange things. But by this time, I became willing to go to any length to stay sober because I don't want to go back and live the way I had lived. And this sponsor would have told me run around the block 14 times backwards. I wouldn't have liked it. But I would have did it. 
because I wanted to stay here more than anything else. And a lot of this stuff seems silly, like it wouldn't work. And I'm here to tell you, even if it's silly, it works. And the sponsor started pounding. Twelve steps to the best of your own ability. I never told this sponsor too much about them children. This sponsor told me this. There's a possibility. This sponsor didn't paint no rosy kind of pictures. Sponsor was very realistic and very honest to me, which I didn't even understand. Said there was a possibility that I might never ever get those children back again. But that I had to accept that. And I did. And at two years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, I left the meeting one night and I got a phone call. And they said, hey, we've been keeping an eye on you. And I said, that's okay today. You could do that. They said, no, you don't understand. We're going to return your children. All five of them at the same time. Mm. Now you can get happy, right? Huh? <laughs> I got scared to death. And I thought, oh my God, by that time, thank God for this sponsor. And I went down and I ranted and I raged. Oh my God, what am I going to do? I don't know how to be a parent. What's a parent? You know, because I had already knew I was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm going to tell you how I did it as I took those 20 questions when I was there. And you know, on one of the questions in there, it says, do you resort to lower companions? And an inferior environment due to drinking? <laughs> I laughed. I was the lower companion <laughs> and inferior environment due to drinking. <laughs> hmm? So this sponsor tells me this. After I tell the sponsor, I said, my God, you know, I am like a functional illiterate. Because I ran the streets from 11 years old. And now I'm going to tell you about a loving higher power and a miracle called Alcoholics Anonymous and a strong sponsor in a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the sponsor told me this, and I wanted to die. Now you take everything you've gathered in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and you take a chapter called The Family Afterwards and you take it home with God, isn't it so easy to work Alcoholics Anonymous during meeting and go home and want to kill the family? Yeah. <laughs> so little by little and inch by inch, we started to grow as a family. And I'm going to show you where I got that growth from. I got it in here. Right here. I got taught by most of you sitting in rooms. Some of you taught me what to do, and some of you taught me what not to do. Hmm? But I learned by example. When I watched you raise your children, and I watched the way you were, I started to learn. And I took that in your families, and I started to grow. Then one day, God decided, not me, that we were going to move to the suburbs, huh? at that time called Hacienda Heights. And then I started to do real strange things, like bake cookies. Huh? <laughs> yeah, you have to. But I got to be very honest with you, because I got friends in this room that know. I bake them hard so they didn't ask too very often for cookies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if any of you need that recipe, see me, it works, right? But this family started to grow. And again, we didn't grow through leaps and bounds. We grew very slow, very painful sometimes, but very lasting. Sponsor giving same information. Leave the track shoes by the front door. You've been running all your life. You no longer run. You stay planted and you walk through whatever comes into your life. You have pain, death, whatever it is. Life on life's terms. But one strong little sponsor. Then I had to lose that sponsor through death. 
And today I still have the same strong sponsorship to a little lady by the name of Angie that makes me drive to Blight four hours up and four hours back. And I'm going to tell you today, to this very day, right now, she'll call her up and she says, I want you to write an inventory. And I'll say something stupid, stupid, because my brain will go, Poof. and I'll say, well, uh, I'm 23 years sober. She said, I didn't ask how long you've been sober. I said, write an inventory, have it here at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning. And that is four hours up and four hours back to go to any lens to this very day to stay sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. But let me share you the group. Those four children, those five children, started to grow straight and strong. And if I start to give you a little care, it means nothing other than gratitude for what God and Alcoholics Anonymous have done in my life. My five children were raised sitting around on these chairs. They were touched by you. And all five of those children grew straight and strong and not warped and crooked. They grew to be beautiful, strong human beings. I call them pillars of the community, right? And I love it. But let me share you a story of growing up for me. One day when my children were smaller, my two daughters decided they would like to join the Girl Scouts. So, I took them down, and I bought them the strangest-looking green uniforms you ever laid eyes on. Then when I got them home, this is what they laid on me. Mom, we need a Girl Scout leader in our school. Mm. Now, my first reaction to those children was, no, no, that's dead. What if somebody sees me? But you got to be real careful with children that get around Alcoholics Anonymous because, see, they catch things in these meetings real quick. And then they take it home and they use it. You know, they'll say stuff to you like, you know, if you've seen a big book laying on the sink and your children put it there, they're giving you information like go to a meeting. You're getting crazy, right? But they threw it back at me. They said, hey, Mom, you can do it one day at a time, right? But you can do it. So there I went for two more years up and down mountains with 40 giggling Girl Scouts, right? And I'm here to tell you, I tried everything. You know, I tried to give them a little cool, like, you know, give them some cool. And I would say, well, maybe we'll call it like the Mafia Troop or something. They didn't, they didn't want that. They were going, no, no, we want the Yellow Butterfly Troop. I was like, Geez. <laughs> But I never forgot my first camp out with these kids. And we're camped out in these mountains, like up in here, we're camped out. And one little girl, they got strange ways. They sit up in tents and then they shake you awake and ask you strange questions. And one did, and she shakes me awake and she goes, Hey, Miss Sanchez, do you realize that this is the first time in my life I've ever been camping? And I looked at that kid. And I said, no shit. <laughs> this is the first time in my life I've ever been camping. <laughs> and I was learning to live. Because the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says, we'll get back in the mainstream of life and we'll learn to live one day at a time out there. Huh? And I'm here to tell you this morning loud and clear that the Girl Scouts of America de-hip me. I started to become a square, 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 and I love it. Let me show you real quickly because time's going to run short. The difference in my life this very morning, 23 years later, I live a... Oh, I can't even explain the life I live. Completely, total, 180 degree turnaround. Completely opposite. Completely opposite. 
Today I live in West Covina because where I lived earlier in Hacienda Heights started to get a little too rowdy for me. Yeah. A few helicopters flew around. I said, I'm out of here. Huh? So I moved deeper into suburbia where it's quiet and people talk to each other. And I live a brand new life. My oldest boy, the oldest of the clan, the one that looked out the back window, lives a brand new beautiful life. And I'm going to share you what he wrote to me while he was in Germany serving for the armed forces. My son wrote it on the back of a picture, and I call it forgiveness. And my son wrote me this. He wrote, thank you for teaching me right from wrong. Thank you for the years. We have been reunited as a family. But most of all, give my thanks to the people in Alcoholics Anonymous for giving you back to us again. And I cried because I knew it took each and every one of you in rooms like this to make it possible that I went home and I raised my family in dignity. And you taught me how to walk and how to talk and how to love. And I took that home and gave it to my family. That wonderful son now lives in Española, New Mexico with his wonderful little family. And he's running for mayor of that small town. He's a little politician, right? I even tell him stuff, well, if your lips are moving, are you lying, right? <laughs> and he loves it. And all of them grew straight and strong. And they're pillars of the community and they walk straight. And they have a deep love and for Alcoholics Anonymous in their hearts and in their souls. Because you gave it to me 23 years ago. You didn't run me out. You didn't say, I don't like the color of your skin. I don't like the way you look. I don't like the way you come from. I don't like because you have tattoos on you. You didn't say none of that. You said, Come with us and stay with us and we'll give you a brand new way of living. And that's exactly what you did. Gave me a brand spanking new way of living. Today what means a lot to me is that great prayer called God grant me the serenity. And this is what it says to me on a daily basis. It says God grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. And I cannot change people, places, nor things to fit me. Hell, it won't go. I tried for years. And the courage, a newcomer takes courage, to change the things I can. And I call that the woman in the mirror. She's the one that I got to change on a daily basis. Alcoholics Anonymous is an inside job. I check myself from inside, and I do my writing, and I check myself, and then I'm able to know the wisdom of the difference. Today I walk in a brand new life, and I live deep, and I live a good life, no matter what comes down, whether it's death. When my brother-in-law died, I looked at it entirely different. When my brother-in-law died, it was because it was his time to go home to that father. And I have no right to try to hold him from going anywhere. And that was his right to go home. And my sister's still growing. She's taught me a lot through watching her walk through that. And today I live that brand new life. But there's one more miracle that I want to share with you. All this time that I was in Alcoholics Anonymous, I never got, I never married. I watched all these crazy relationships go on, and I would go, oh, no, please, not me. And I never had to worry too much, because if anybody ever approached me, I would say, I have five kids that eat a lot, and they were gone, right? <laughs> <laughs> My last son grew up, got married, and moved to Houston, Texas about three years ago, and he lives a very well life. And a beautiful gentleman that i known for 12 years, God put in my life two and a half years ago, and we got married. And I love my husband very much today because he's a very gentle, kind man. Very gentle and very kind. And God put him with me today because he loves Alcoholics Anonymous like I love Alcoholics Anonymous. And for that, I am very grateful. 
and we walk hand in hand in the sunshine of the spirit today and I know peace in my heart and I got to skip to my step and I want to thank each and every one of you for giving that to me. God bless. Keep coming back. It works. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.